Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Pedro Cuardri was standing outside, breathing in the fresh spring air. The jail gate had just slammed shut noisily behind him. The guy took another deep breath and put a small gray gym bag on his shoulder. Freedom! Pedro shouted out loud, smiling at how different that simple word sounded outside the jail cell. Pedro wandered toward the bus stop, enjoying every step in his old, shabby sneakers. He was wearing them at the trial, and on the day that had changed his life forever. Pedro was not a murderer or a thief, but he had a difficult fate and he made only one wrong step that made everything go down the drain. Pedro Cuardri was about 27 years old. He was born into an ordinary middle-class family. His mother, Sandra, worked as a clerk in a grocery store. He didn't have a father and didn't know anything about him because his mother didn't want to talk about it. Instead, Pedro had a stepfather, Emilio, a man with a troubled character who was an alcoholic. Sandra tried her best to re-educate her wayward husband, but to no avail. He could survive for a week without alcohol, and he would even go back to the factory and work a few shifts, and then it would start all over again. Little Pedro was often beaten by his drunken stepfather, but he tolerated it. He was weak, and frankly speaking, he was afraid. While he was sober, it was still impossible to communicate with him. But when he was drunk, Sandra tried to protect her son from his stepfather's beatings, but she rarely succeeded. Usually, drunken Emilio would start by wrecking his flimsy furniture, overturning chairs and tables, pouring out the soup his wife was cooking, breaking mugs, and throwing Pedro's toys out the window. After that, the stepfather seemed to go crazy. The broken furniture was not enough for him, and he started pushing and kicking Sandra. The boy tried to protect his mother, even though he was weak and tiny, but he could not just stand and watch or hide from everything in the room, and he got punished for it. The police did not interfere with the Kuardri family, as it happens in such cases. The police sometimes talked to Emilio, but it did not help. So Pedro's mother never got any help from the police. And she loved Emilio in her own way with that desperate female love. When due to age and circumstances, there is no hope to find someone else. The kindergarten teachers often asked Sandra why her son had a bruise under his eye or on his hands. Such things rarely happened in kindergarten. The mother always answered that Pedro had stumbled in the yard or had fallen off the swing. She was a good woman, but she was too afraid of her alcoholic husband. Pedro only silently nodded, not wanting to betray his mother. One day, an awful thing happened in their family. Pedro found a cute little kitten in the yard and named it Veo. In another drunken stupor, the stepfather tried to throw the kitten out the window, as he had done with the toys before. Pedro could not tolerate such a thing, and at the age of six, for the first time, he ran at his stepfather with his fists. It was something Emilio had not expected from his stepson. The boy attacked him like a predator baby, kicking and punching him. Although the man was a hundred times stronger, Emilio was frightened by such fury, and so he spared the kitten. However, in the evening, when the mother returned from work, she was beaten. The poor woman has never found out about the incident with the cat, and has not understood why her husband has beaten her again. But the next morning, sobered up, Emilio advised Sandra to take her son to a boxing club. You keep taking care of him. Do you want him to grow up to be a woman? The boy has potential, aggression, pure aggression. Stepfather held his powerful fist up in front of his wife's face. 
What are you talking about? The wife asks suspiciously. If he did something wrong again, I'm begging you, don't touch him. He's just a child. That's not what I mean, Emilio said. Pedro should be involved in sports, you know? He's a violent kid. We need to put his energy in the right direction. Sandra pursed her lips. She just didn't know how to react to such a proposal from her husband. Besides, where can she get the money to pay for the sports section? Well, it's a good idea, she agreed. But what kind of sport is right for him? If figure skating, we can't afford it. It's too expensive. The stepfather answered disappointedly. Sandra, figure skating? Seriously? Emilio lightly tapped his head with his fist, hinting at his wife's stupidity. I'm talking about wrestling or boxing. You are raising a real man, not a weak dancer. Sandra wondered why her husband wanted his stepson to go into boxing. After all, he rejoices every time Pedro can't fight back because he's weak. Although she has long noticed that the sober Emilio and the drunk Emilio are two completely different people. Well, okay, I can go to a sports school and talk to the coach. Who's going to pay? It's not cheap. Well, as usual, we'll take the money from the family budget. Emilio answered and took another bottle of vodka from under the kitchen table. From the family budget. Sandra sighed heavily. So I'll have to look for another part-time job. Pedro, who had been hiding around the corner, could hear every word the adult said and hugged his kitten as if he was trying to protect him. Boxing? He couldn't believe they were sending him to the boxing section. After all, it was great, but at the same time, scary. What if he can't take it? What if he's not strong enough like the other boys? He had always been physically weak, his mother knew that, but he really wanted to finally learn how to fight and protect himself and his mother. The next day was his mother's day off, and she took Pedro to the sports school near their home. It was a very old, small brick building, but the boy thought it could withstand anything. The boxing section was in the basement. When Pedro saw the other boys sparring, he was thrilled. He did not understand the technique of their blows, but the smooth movements of the fighters fascinated him, and precise blows made his tiny heart beat faster. He held his mother's hand tightly, which was noticed by the head coach, Xavier Loraz. Who's there? A new fighter? Why are you holding your son's hand so tightly as if the wind were about to blow him away? The coach laughed. Xavier was a tough, stern man who frightened the mother a little. But later, she was glad to have someone like Mr. Loraz working with her son. Pedro needed some normal man to learn from. She couldn't find a better person for Pedro than his coach. I took my son to you, she began hesitantly. My husband said the boy should be involved in sports as early as possible. The coach looked critically at the skinny Pedro and then looked at Sandra. There was nothing good on his face. Why didn't his father come? It would have been more convenient to discuss it with a man. He's working. He has a shift at the factory. Pedro's mother lied, blushing like a tomato. What do you want to discuss? The boy wants to fight to defend his motherland. Motherland? Xavier looked at Pedro. Xavier incredulously, and then he asked the boy, Can you do at least 10 push-ups to begin with? Of course I can. The boy shouted joyfully. Show me, the coach said with a serious look. The boy immediately let go of his mother's hand and rushed to the mat, intending to show him everything he was capable of. At this time, Xavier took the boy's mother aside and asked quietly, Are you sure you want your son to be boxing? Don't get me wrong, I'll accept him, but he's too skinny. Sandra just sighed. Look, I understand that my boy may not be a natural-born boxer, but couldn't you at least try to train him? 
it will be better for him if you can train him, and it will come in handy in his adult life. What about the boy's father? Doesn't he want to train him? Or is there no time? The coach asked. My husband, we have a difficult situation at home. Sandra tried to explain. Xavier looked at Pedro's mother for a few seconds before he understood what she was talking about. Well, let's see what we can do. Maybe he'll succeed. All this time, the coach was watching her son. The boy who had started briskly was exhausted by the sixth push-up. He was now sitting in a sweat. His weak muscles were shaking with exertion. Not bad. The man decided to cheer him up. You just have to exercise more and eat better. You'll build up your muscle mass. It's hard to fight without it. The boy nodded weakly and smiled back. His heart was beating fast and his cheeks were red. Come back tomorrow at 9 and we'll start then, he promised. His mother looked gratefully at the tall, muscular man, but immediately turned her gaze away. Now her boy would not be alone, the woman thought before Pedro happily ran up to her, wrapping his skinny arms around her. A year later, Pedro's mother passed away. A sudden heart attack caught Sandra right at work behind the store counter. Neighbors then chattered that the woman's heart failed because she had learned of her husband's cheating. As for the stepfather, he just ignored all these rumors, calling his late wife's friends idiots. Pedro had just turned six at the time, he had to go to school, in first grade, but the boy was completely unprepared. He had no uniform or stationery. Thanks to his mother's good friends, they took care of the child and helped him get ready for school. The boy went to first grade in an old shabby uniform, which he got after someone else's long-grown son. Pedro did not complain. He understood that he was now alone with his stepfather and was very grateful to his mother for taking him to the boxing section at the time. Pedro had been training with Coach Laraz for a year now and had certainly gotten stronger since he had started. He was no longer so weak and could take a punch. His new physical form helped him even in his communication with his stepfather. Emilio did not put Pedro in an orphanage, but he did stop drinking. As before, when something irritated him, the stepfather tried to vent his anger and dissatisfaction on the boy. But now, Pedro was more confident in his abilities and could protect himself and his cat Veo. One day, the stepfather, being drunk, attacked the cat again. He tried to kick the poor animal as hard as he could, thus hurting Pedro as well. The thing was, that the boy had forgotten to set Emilio's alarm clock for a certain time, and he was late for work after another binge. The stepfather got even drunker and decided to take revenge on his stepson through a cat. Flea-ridden beast! The drunken man swung his fist in a burst of rage. You're always walking around begging for food. Whose money do we use to buy your food? My money! We buy it with the money we get from the allowance, said Pedro instead of Veo, who ran straight from the hallway into the kitchen. He had just come back from training. Uncle Emilio, you haven't brought home a penny this month. You just drink it all away. The boy grabbed the cat from under his stepfather's feet and threw him into the hallway, slamming the door. The animal was safe and meowed appreciatively. The stepfather's face immediately turned red. What are you talking about, little bastard? Emilio was furious and swung his big fist at the stepson. However, Pedro was ready. With an abrupt movement, ignoring his stepfather's threateningly outstretched arms, the boy swung his fist and hit Emilio in the jaw. This is your punishment for what you did to mom and Veo, the boy said sullenly. And one more thing, don't you dare hit that cat again when I'm not home. If I find out about it, you will regret it, and don't you dare touch me again. Pedro hated him, but tried to be polite. His mother's upbringing had not been in vain. 
But as long as he lived in this house, he would not allow anyone to humiliate or raise a hand against him or his pet. When I grow up, I'll take Veo and move out of your house, the boy said one last time, and you can live here as you wish. The stepfather replied, rubbing his bruised jaw. Little bastard, I should have put you in an orphanage. They would have taught you some manners. I shouldn't tell your mother to take you to the sports school. Pedro just grinned. Do you think I'm too young to understand everything? You couldn't put me in an orphanage because you were getting money from me as a foster parent, aren't you? If you had put me in an orphanage then, you wouldn't have money for booze now. That's it. With these words, the boy came out of the kitchen, took his cat in his arms, and locked himself in his room. Time went on. Pedro turned 17. He was getting ready to graduate from high school. By this time, the young Kuadri became a young, promising junior league boxer. Pedro became a strong, broad-shouldered, confident guy and continued to train. Coach rubbed his chin thoughtfully and then smiled. You know what? Bring your cat. I have flowers at home, but if you promise he won't chew it, then I think we can be friends. That night, Pedro packed his bags. He had been buying clothes and everything else with his competition money, took his cat, and went to live with his coach. The stepfather didn't even notice his stepson's absence. He was drunk as usual. Pedro decided he would call him later and explain everything. Especially, the boy did not want to get into any conflicts with him now. He was too tired of Emilio's exhausting tantrums and uncontrollable attacks of anger. And so the three of them lived together, Pedro, Xavier, and Veo. As Pedro later recalled in his small jail cell, these were the best two years of his life. The guy remembered how in one of his toughest fights, Coach Laraz still believed in him and encouraged him, didn't let him give up. To the left, to the left, don't miss the uppercut. Xavier shouted, standing on the other side of the ring. Think about the basics, what I've been teaching you for so many years. The one who looks weak always hits harder. Why? Because he's angrier. Pedro got beaten badly. The opponent was strong. Although they both fought at light heavyweight, the guy looked like a natural born heavyweight. After receiving several devastating blows to the body and head, Pedro was ready to give up. But the coach came to the rescue with his advice. Pedro Cuadri won that fight, becoming the youngest middleweight champion of the region. Unfortunately, that was the last time he fought professionally under the guidance of Xavier Laraz. In fact, it was the last time he saw his coach alive. Trouble happened when he wasn't expecting it. One night, when the coach was returning home from the sports school, he was hit by an expensive car at high speed. That car was driven by some rich scumbag. The worst thing is that the murderer was never found. They must have bribed whoever they had to, Pedro thought. The day he identified Xavier Laraza's body in the morgue was the worst day of his life on par with the day his mother died. The whole sports school was at the funeral. Laraz not only brought up there a dozen champions during his life, but he was a really good man, a real friend, and a mentor for the guys who decided to devote their lives to sports. After the funeral, Pedro decided to join the army. That's how he decided to overcome his grief. The army became Pedro's home. Pedro endured real family tragedies and eventually ended up in army barracks at 19. The days went by one after the other. Endless patrols, military duties, and theory classes were held at the same time every day. In some way, Pedro liked the army's discipline. It helped him distract from his dark thoughts of the past. But very soon, the monotony of Barrack's life began to bore him more and more. That would have made Pedro's young soul stale. 
but one day he met Clara. She was a correspondence student studying economics in the same city where Pedro lived. The young people met quite normally. The girl was in a hurry to catch the bus, but she missed it. And Pedro was driving an army truck. He had been sent to the city to pick up provisions bought for the army kitchen. Hello, miss. Can I give you a ride? The young soldier asked the student, smiling. Actually, I wanted to take a bus, but I missed it. Clara answered uncertainly. Pedro immediately tried to reassure her. Don't worry, I serve in the army and live nearby. The battalion commander sent me to the city for groceries. I won't hurt you. You have my lieutenant's word. The student pondered over the guy's proposal for a few seconds until he defiantly looked at his watch, making it clear that the time is ticking and the girl should make the decision. Well, okay, Clara finally agreed. Just do not harass me and fasten your seatbelt. She demanded sternly. I don't want to get into an accident. Yes, Commander. Pedro joked, put his hand to the visor of his uniform cap, and then laughed. Clara also laughed at her ostentatious austerity. Later, when they were on their way, she apologized for her tone. Excuse me for being so harsh. It's kind of a professional deformation, and it's hereditary. My parents are university professors. My mom teaches philosophy, and my dad... My dad is a famous historian. Florentino Casals. Maybe you've heard of him? Maybe, replied Pedro, smiling enigmatically. He really liked the girl, so he did not want to lie. Well, here we are. Clara said sadly as the soldier drove her home. Without your help, I would have stood at the bus stop and waited for the next bus now. At that moment, Pedro realized it was time to make a decisive step. It was now or never. Excuse me, Clara. They had gotten to know each other on the way. But would you like to go to the local cinema next weekend? There's a big premiere coming up. We could watch it together and discuss it over coffee and ice cream afterward. Clara pretended to think about it. In fact, she was pleased with the proposal made by a young military man, perhaps a future colonel. If it's not an action movie or a horror movie, then I would like to watch it. The student replied, I don't like everything exploding on the screen, or on the contrary, just bloody rivers everywhere. Clara wrinkled her little nose gracefully. No, it's something historical, Pedro answered calmly. I promise, even if there are any explosions, it's not too many. The young people spent the next weekend together. Pedro managed to take two days off. The boy and the girl quickly found a common language. Pedro liked the intelligence and sophistication of the gentle Clara, and Clara liked Pedro's somewhat primitive ancient strength. For her, he was a selfless protector, a knight, ready to fulfill any wish of a beautiful lady, no matter what it was. The further Pedro went, the more he realized that he was crazy about Clara. The couple constantly corresponded and exchanged photos. They both loved this romance in letters that reminded them of the style of relationships from old movies. Clara was constantly writing to her boyfriend about how much she loved him and was waiting for their next meeting, and how slowly time was dragging on when they couldn't be together. Occasionally, they did manage to see each other, usually on the guy's rare weekends, and they spent together every single minute. In the evenings before they went to bed, other soldiers begged Pedro to read them some of the letters Clara sent him. Even though the letters were sometimes very intimate, Pedro chose places where Clara expressed her feelings to him passionately. At some point, Pedro and Clara realized they wanted to be together officially, and so the young people decided that they would get married as soon as it's possible. Even though they were both young and Pedro hadn't even met the girl's parents yet, it seemed to the couple that all problems would surely be solved. The only thing they wanted was to be together. 
Pedro had a pile of letters from Clara under his mattress, which he reread sometimes when he had some personal time before bed. After another successful day of service. Six months before the end of the military service, everything changed abruptly. Clara suddenly stopped sending letters. At first, he thought something had happened at the post office, a problem that made it impossible for the envelopes to reach him. But the other boys continued to receive letters from their friends and relatives. So it was not the postal service. Pedro became very worried about whether something terrible had happened to his beloved. Or maybe it was about her family. What if something had happened to Clara's father? Especially lately, the girl had been complaining that he was having more and more heart problems. The guy asked the unit commander for permission and started calling the girl regularly, first at home and then on her cell phone. For some reason, there was no answer on the home phone. But when Pedro called her cell phone, he was horrified to hear the voice of an answering machine informing him that the number was wrong. Checking the sheet from the notebook where he had written down Clara's phone, he made sure there could be no mistake. The number was indeed correct. Anticipating something wrong, Pedro slowly hung up the phone. With trembling hands, he folded the sheet with the number. The boy was confused. He did not know what to do now. His friends advised him to wait for the demobilization and then to go to Clara to find out what happened. Maybe something really happened. Don't worry, Pedro. They might have moved somewhere. Oh, really? Then why didn't she tell me? The young soldier grinned bitterly. No, that doesn't sound like Clara. And if something had happened to her, her parents would have let me know. His friends just shook their heads. They didn't dare to tell about the most obvious assumption. Perhaps Clara simply got tired of Pedro and she left him. The day the service finally came to an end was a day Pedro would remember for the rest of his life. The sky was covered with leaden gray clouds and a cold autumn rain started. Pedro had no umbrella so he had to cover himself with his jacket to stay dry. When he was outside the unit he immediately rushed toward Clara's house. Pedro's heart also seemed to run at a gallop. Without noticing the huge puddles, the boy crossed the familiar streets and the large park with tall, gloomy trees, where the young people loved to walk during their rare meetings. Finally, Pedro Cuardri arrived at the beautiful house where his fiance lived. The house had been built recently, so the area around it and the interior of the new spacious entranceway impressed him with its brightness and neatness. It's strange, but during the whole time of their relationship, Clara never invited Pedro home. He had never been inside. The girl explained that her parents were very strict and conservative, and if they saw their daughter with a man, they could easily put her under house arrest. Pedro joked that they would have to meet anywhere after the service was over. Clara responded that it would be better to wait a little longer as she wanted to prepare her parents for the moment of the meeting. Who are you looking for? The concierge at the large reception desk asked the guy sternly. The fat woman was looking at Pedro through the thick lenses of her glasses. Does Clara Casals still live in apartment 78? He remembered the address where he had sent letters back to his beloved. Casals, can I ask you who are you? She asked incredulously. My name is Pedro Cuardri. I am Clara's fiance. Pedro answered calmly, but his heart was beating so hard that it was about to jump out of his chest. For a minute, the concierge's face was motionless and still incredulous. Then her expression quickly changed to a smile, and a second later there was a loud, contemptuous laugh through her brightly painted lips. Fiance? You? The woman struggled to utter through laughter. What is so funny? Pedro was confused like a child. No, nothing, nothing at all. 
The concierge laughed while wiping the mascara that was smeared on her face. It's just that you're a little late. Clara's been married for three months. Pedro felt all the blood drain from his face, his lips refusing to obey, but he still managed to speak. Clara? Married? He didn't remember running up the stairs to the sixth floor or the concierge yelling something insulting at him. He quickly realized that Clara's apartment had to be on the sixth or seventh floor, and he was right. Once in the spacious hallway, Pedro saw Clara coming out of her apartment, and a man, apparently the girl's husband. Everything turned upside down inside the boy. All the thoughts that made him calm and rational were destroyed by a bitter wave of rage, resentment, and incomprehension. The feelings overwhelmed Pedro, giving him no chance to come to his senses. Clara, my love, he whispered. How could you, how could you do this to me, to us? Clara, as slim and beautiful as the day they had first met, looked at her ex-fiance with huge, frightened eyes. Next to her was a tall, skinny guy, slightly older than the girl. Expensive sunglasses, a few gold rings on his thin fingers, and a fashionable beard told that Clara's husband was an avid fan of nightclubs and a fashionable party animal. Judging by his bright clothes, he was just another son of rich parents who had not earned anything himself and was incapable of doing anything. My love, he said questioningly, looking at his wife. Who is that and what the hell is he talking about? Clara frightenedly took the hand of her husband. Santiago, it's an old acquaintance. We went to school together, and then he was expelled. Pedro couldn't believe his eyes. So it was true. Clara had two gold rings on her ring finger. A classic ring, and an engagement ring with a big yellow diamond-like stone. She raised her hand so that Pedro could see them and understand. And I told you, Pedro whispered sorrowfully. I can't understand it. How could you choose this over me? The boy pointed at the rich man as if he were a disgusting insect. You wouldn't understand, Pedro, Clara said, stammering. Santiago is different. Well, yeah, the ex-fiance said. Santiago is different. It's money and luxury, expensive clubs that I couldn't take you to because I'm just a poor soldier. And I would never take you to the nightclubs because I needed a family, not all of this. Pedro looked at Clara in disgust. Suddenly, the husband intervened in the conversation. I don't understand. What is your problem with my wife? Who are you? He seriously decided to find out what was going on, so he took off his sunglasses. Who am I? I am her fiancé, Pedro, he said with a bitter smile. We planned to get married, we loved each other, and then, I don't know where you came from, but it seems that our wedding is canceled. Right, Clara? The boy said sarcastically to the frustrated girl. There was an awkward pause. It was as if Clara were frozen in place, hiding behind her husband's back. Clara looked at Pedro without uttering a word. Finally, Santiago slowly moved toward his rival. I don't care what was between you before me, but she's with me now. He began to talk dismissively. Do you understand? We're married. The rich man spelled. While you were in your stinking barracks, did you ever think about what you could give her? Trips abroad, expensive jewelry, yachts and villas? You have no money for that. What I could have given her was none of your business, Pedro said. He didn't notice how his body suddenly took up his usual boxing stance, his fists raised into the air. But you, 
and people like you ruin the lives of good people. Good people? Do you think you are good? Santiago laughed scornfully. You're a pauper. You're just a soldier. Get out of here, or I will call the security guards. The woman at the front desk might have told the police about you. They'll come and arrest you. Pedro didn't remember what happened next. His body reacted before he could pull himself together. He attacked the skinny Santiago and began to hit him, one hit after another, just as he had done in the ring. Through the black veil of rage, Pedro heard Clara screaming and begging him to stop beating her disgusting husband. Soon, he felt someone's strong hands pulling him away. It was the police. The concierge called them. Pedro's skin was pierced by a powerful shot of electric shock. All the boy remembered was the involuntary contraction of all his muscles, and then total darkness. Pedro Cuadri was sentenced to three and a half years in prison, and the possibility of an extension of up to 10 years if the victim did not come out of the coma. Pedro knocked out Santiago. Santiago's weak health could not withstand the boxer's blows, and he was between life and death. Clara didn't show up at the trial. All this time she spent in the regional hospital next to her spouse. Had she ever even loved Pedro? That was a question the guy couldn't answer. The only thing he was sure of was that he would never see Clara again. Every night, lying in a jail cell, Pedro blamed himself for not being able to control himself back then. He would reply with something sarcastic in response to the scoundrel's mockery and walk away proudly so that Clara would be ashamed, so that she would realize what she had traded her happiness for. But alas, what had been done could not be undone. So every night spent in jail seemed even longer than the previous night. Two and a half years later, he was finally out on parole. By that time, Santiago had recovered, and to Pedro's luck, he did not ask for an extension of his sentence. The investigator later explained to Pedro that Santiago's father was an important person, a member of parliament, and he didn't want the media to know about it, especially because there were elections ahead. As he approached the bus stop, Pedro thought about how he was going to live and what he was going to do. He didn't want to go home because everyone there already knew about the crime he had committed. Imprisonment, at such a young age, had badly damaged both his professional and personal reputation. Hardly anyone in his small town would be happy to see the boxer who came back from jail. His stepfather won't be happy about living with his ex-convict stepson either. In the last letter Pedro received from his only relative, he made it clear that he didn't want to live in the same house with Pedro again. He didn't even want to see him. In addition, Emilio had almost drunk himself to death. Neighbors, friends of the deceased mother, wrote to Pedro that this scoundrel had not long to live. It was good that there was someone in the familiar environment who did not turn their back on Pedro. But the boy realized that none of them would be willing to accept an ex-convict in their home either. Getting on the bus, Pedro Cuardri made a difficult, but as he thought at the time, the right decision. He wanted to break the ties with his past and try to start a new life. So his way was not to the hometown, but to the capital. At first, the city greeted Pedro in a very unfriendly way. For a long time, the guy could not find a job, and nothing was surprising about that. As soon as an employer found out about a criminal record, Pedro was immediately pointed at the door. Nevertheless, there were those who not only wanted to make fun of the ex-convict, but also to frankly deceive him. The first time it happened was when Pedro managed to get a job at the taxi company. At first, Pedro was happy about the job, because the money was good and he was a good driver, but after a few shifts, 
he was totally disappointed. It turned out that most of the money had to be given to the leader of the brigade. And what was left was barely enough to buy cereals and milk. But we had agreed that I get 60%. Pedro continued to insist. Why should I only get 30%? It's like a robbery. You should complain less and work more. Maybe you would have earned something, said the boss quietly. Do you think I don't know you just got out of jail? You should be glad you got a job at all, thug. Or do you want to go back? Haven't you been in jail long enough? He threatened Pedro. Eventually, the poor guy left the office with a miserable paycheck, and his self-esteem dropped even lower. He knew that he would not be treated well in such places and could be set up, and Pedro never wanted to go back to jail again. The second time, luck seemed to smile on the boy when he managed to get a job as a storekeeper in a big supermarket. The first two months were going quite well until the store manager accidentally found out that his best storekeeper had just been released from jail. This time, Pedro prudently concealed the criminal record and had no idea how this information could suddenly come out. But unfortunately, he was immediately fired, so the guy did not even have time to explain anything to the management. Pedro rented a small room on the outskirts of the city. He only had enough money to pay the landlady, a sweet old woman named Inez Duenas. The guy lived extremely poor, but still had the last bit of dignity and did not become homeless. Inez, I'm afraid this is my last month at your apartment, said Pedro sadly, handing the money to the old woman. No way, dear Pedro. What happened? The old woman was confused. She knew Pedro's story and did not judge him. After all, he had the right to defend his honor before that rich man. Inez had lived alone for a very long time. Her only son had died in a terrible accident when he was not even 20. The old landlady liked Pedro, and once she got to know him, she really liked his company. When she learned that her tenant had been fired once again, Inez just waved her hand. Calm down, Pedro. You don't have to go anywhere. Stay here. Sooner or later, you will find a good job. You'll see. There will be kind people who won't look at your past. And honestly, I feel safer when you are here. As you can see, our neighborhood is not safe. The old woman wrapped herself in her scarf and assured the young man. Pedro thanked her and promised that as soon as he found a job, he would pay. Inez only smiled as she listened to the young man's fervent promises. After all, she did not shelter him because of money, but because he reminded her of her late son. One evening, on his way back from another job interview, Pedro saw a dog lying motionless near the parking lot. When he got closer, he heard the poor animals whimpering. The dog had a broken paw. Surely someone hadn't seen this dog and ran it over at the parking spot, and they didn't even help. Bastards. The dog was young, almost a puppy, looking like a dush hound mixed with a mongrel. The little black eyes constantly looked around and velvet ears fluttered, as if from the invisible wind. The dog was nervous, not knowing what to expect from the strange man bent over his injured leg. Pedro decided to take the dog home. At home, Pedro and Inez bandaged his paw, but they took him to the vet the next day. Fortunately, it turned out that the bone was not broken. The dog had a bad sprain and a couple of bruises on his body, but that turned out to be fixable with proper care and rest. The old lady was very happy to hear that her new pet was going to be okay. She named the dog and it turned out to be a girl, La Casito. And so they lived together, Pedro, the old woman Inez, and La Casito. After a couple of weeks, Pedro managed to get two part-time jobs, as a longshoreman and as a night watchman in a pulp mill. 
Like Inez had said, there were finally people who didn't care about his past. What they needed was, first and foremost, a responsible worker. And Pedro was that person. One day, on his way back from his shift at the factory, Pedro witnessed a terrible scene. Near a nightclub outside a fancy neon pink sports car, three large men tried to harass a young but completely drunk girl. Her short, gold sequin dress was dangerously pulled up, exposing her thighs. One of the thugs was panting strangely, trying to touch the girl's legs, while the other two were already examining the contents of her purse to see if the car keys were in it. Pedro stopped, realizing that the wealthy beauty was apparently the victim of typical burglars who waited for their drunken victims outside nightclubs. But the intentions of the third guy, the one who groped the girl, were different and Pedro did not like it. Hey you, yes you, he called out and nodded when they finally turned their attention away from their victim. Leave the girl alone, can't you see she's in no mood to talk to you? The other man, who was trying unsuccessfully to find the keys in the girl's purse, looked menacingly at Pedro. Boy, you'd better get out of here, can't you see the grown ups are busy? Yeah right confirmed the thug who pulled the drunken beauty against the wall. That's my wife, and we're having a moment of passion. Got it? All three of them laughed loudly. And the girl, obviously awakened by the loud sounds, mumbled something incomprehensible. Pedro knew he was taking a big risk, but he couldn't leave a helpless, drunken girl with those gorillas. He would never forgive himself for that. Not wanting to continue the pointless conversation, Pedro quickly ran up to the biggest of them, who was just holding the girl and gave him his trademark right hook. The bully groaned but didn't let go of his victim. The second guy ran up to Pedro and quickly hit him a couple of times. Pedro did not expect to face an equal opponent, so he was a bit taken back. The third guy took advantage of this and hit Pedro hard and sharply on the head. A fierce fight broke out. Pedro fought back as best he could. He knew that if he gave up now, the girl would die or something worse can happen. An experienced boxer gave the three perpetrators the punches his favorite coach had taught him. As Pedro cunningly dodged another punch, it was as if he could hear the voice of Xavier Larraz in his head. Lower, bend down. Good, good, good. Sharp, sharp. They won't wait. Hit him in the ribs! Hit him in the ribs! Finally, the police and an ambulance arrived at the scene of the fight. The three bastards were immediately handcuffed, and Pedro was taken to the hospital. Although he was an experienced fighter, he had suffered several serious injuries, including a couple of broken ribs and a concussion. Nevertheless, the boy was overjoyed. He had managed to save a rich stranger which meant that he would have one more good day in his life. But the rich girl's savior was never given the proper treatment. Pedro had no money, so he received only first aid with a bandage and a long list of necessary medications. He was discharged from the hospital the very next day. The doctor asked him to leave the room and apologized for that. Pedro Cuardri, you know, you can't stay here for more than a couple of days. I understand. Pedro nodded. What else could he do? Can you at least call a cab? The doctor agreed. She felt sorry for the guy who had saved the girl. While she was recovering from a huge dose of alcohol she had consumed the night before, he, a simple worker, risked his life to save her. The woman paid for Pedro's cab and wished him a quick recovery. When he returned home, he listened to an angry tirade from Inez. He couldn't warn her that he was in the hospital. Then, Pedro went to his room for a while. He needed to come to his senses and think about what had happened. A couple of days later, a large black business car pulled up to Inez's building, and a man in an expensive dark suit got out and went up to the old woman's apartment. 
Inez was feeding La Casito when the doorbell rang. It was Claude Valdez, one of the most powerful businessmen in the capital. As it turned out, Pedro saved his daughter. Asking permission to see the young man, Claude Valdez stepped cautiously into his room. Inez brought his guest coffee and then quietly left. It was time to walk La Casito. After thanking the guy for saving his silly daughter, Mr. Valdez decided to move on to the main purpose of his visit. Tell me, Pedro Cuadri, is it true that you were released from jail not so long ago and have already worked in several places in our city? I mean the taxi company and the supermarket warehouse? Yeah, I just got out recently, he answered honestly. And how did you know about that? I tried to work in taxi service and as a storekeeper, but I didn't steal anything there and I didn't scam anybody. Cloud smiled a little. Well, I have connections in the police, so I can find out everything. That's why I know about your past. And good for you, you didn't lie. I need honest people now. Tell me, the businessman asked, what crime did you commit? Pedro told him his simple story, and then the businessman was silent for a while. But then he said, Thank you. What you did wasn't so bad. To be completely honest, I would have done exactly the same thing if I were you. Cloud said confidently, The only mistake you made was that you hit the fool too professionally. You should have hit him more softly. Maybe you wouldn't end up in jail. Well, I can't change my past. Pedro responded. Now it's better to solve the current problems. That's true. The businessman agreed and decided to close this topic, seeing how unpleasant it was for Pedro. Then, after a short talk about life, Cloud suddenly made an unusual request. For the first seconds, Pedro thought the businessman was joking. Pedro, I see that you are a good guy, not a thief not a murderer, not a rapist. You're a good fighter too. That's all I really need from you. Listen, Pedro, the businessman said to him confidently, help me to re-educate my daughter. Lola has become completely uncontrollable. She does not listen to me. God, how can I help you with that? Pedro was shocked. That silly girl has completely stopped listening to me, Cloud explained. I told her to stop going to those clubs and parties and start thinking about her future, but she said to me, I have only one life, daddy, and I have to try everything. And this is the result we got. I think Lola's even started taking drugs. I already have enough problems. I don't need this. I need a guard for her, but I need a reliable person. Do you understand? I've tried so many things. I've hired all kinds of people. Nobody can deal with her. So I thought, maybe you can do it. You know, I do not trust these guards from private agencies. They'll find some dirt to blackmail me, and then I'll have to pay for it too. But you are a simple guy. But clever and honest. I'll pay you generously. You have my word. I need to think about it, Pedro replied. I just don't even know what to say yet. Besides, I need some time to recover. Sure. Think about it. Take your time. Cloud nodded. This is my phone number. Please call me if you agree to help. Before leaving, the man turned to him and said, Please try to understand me. I can't keep track of it all by myself. I have a big business, stress, transactions, and contracts. And now my daughter is causing a lot of trouble as well. Okay, Mr. Cloud Valdez. Pedro smiled in response. I will think about your proposal, I promise. The businessman nodded, said goodbye once again, and left. Pedro thought it over, and finally decided that it was worth a try. Two weeks later, as soon as he felt better, Pedro called Cloud Valdez and agreed to be his daughter's guard. Thank you, Daddy. You've been so helpful. 
Lola was hysterical when she found out that her father had assigned Pedro as her new security guard. I told you this guy would be your shadow from now on. Wherever you go, he goes. Don't even try to argue, the businessman told, furious at his daughter's stubbornness. In case you've forgotten, dear, Pedro recently saved your life and honor when you left the nightclub drunk to the point that you weren't even aware of what was going on around you. I didn't ask to save my life, Lola said sarcastically. He could just pass me by, but he thinks he is a knight. Pedro and Lola's cooperation didn't work out from the beginning. The young rich girl, who was barely 20, could annoy her new security guard so much in one day that he wanted to just silently leave everything and go back to work as a watchman or a longshoreman. Sometimes, the girl would purposely mock him the whole day, forcing him to go with her to endless shopping malls and beauty salons. He saw how she wasted enormous sums to buy dresses and shoes. Pedro could only dream of such money. However, the guard was patient, and gradually, his patience was rewarded. Lola got used to the guy and got to treat him better, especially after he got her out of several difficult situations. One day, Lola overdosed. Pedro was terrified. He immediately found a private clinic nearby where the girl was rescued. After that incident, Lola promised that if Pedro didn't tell her father about it, she would stop taking drugs. To the girl's surprise, Pedro kept his promise. Lola was truly impressed by such devotion, and she also tried to stop taking drugs. After a while, she even made an appointment with a narcologist, secretly from her father, so that she could completely get rid of her addiction. Then one day, Pedro stopped a pesky guy who had been stalking Lola for months. Pedro spoke to him man to man and explained to the rich, spoiled guy that it was better to leave the girl alone. As before, Pedro did not say anything to Lola's father about it. The guy was discreet and always kept his promise, and Lola liked that. The young man didn't realize at what point they had developed feelings for each other. Lola suddenly realized that her affection for the silent guard was much deeper and more sensual than it should have been, and Pedro realized that he could not imagine his life without the feisty but vulnerable Lola. For a long time, Lola and Pedro had to hide their feelings from Cloud Valdez. The girl was afraid that his reaction might be unpredictable. You know, he's very strict with me, she told Pedro. He raised me alone and used to control everything. My mom died of leukemia when I was a baby, so I became such a badass. I thought that if I would be bold and brave, stubborn, then the disease would never dare take me away from my father the way it took my mother away from me. I have been afraid all my life that I might get sick too. No one will ever take you away from me and Cloud Valdez, Pedro promised, hugging her gently. Just give up all your bad habits and everything will be different, you'll see. And your father will calm down and will know that you don't need to be under constant control. Believe me, one wrong decision can turn a person's whole life upside down. And if you make such decisions every day, it's like walking on a minefield. You never know when and where it's going to explode. Pedro told Lola the whole story of his life, told her about the mistakes that had cost him almost three years of normal life. After that, it was as if Lola became another person. Every day, the girl learned to control herself gradually subduing her inner demons and thus earning the respect and praise of her father and her lover. What do you mean you were pregnant? Cloud was furious, having a serious conversation with Lola and Pedro. How? When did you have time? H how could you? The businessman turned to the guard. I was a fool. I was so happy. I thought my daughter was finally in good hands has finally changed. And now, Daddy, I'm pregnant by Pedro. Then, calming down a bit, he asked the lovers, when do you even plan to get married? 
Don't you think I'm just going to let it go on by itself? Lola, you're so sly. Pedro and Lola breathed a sigh of relief. They both knew that Cloud Valdez was a strict and stern man, but his heart had always been big and kind, and he certainly wished to nothing but good for his daughter. She chose a man like Pedro to be her husband, so be it, especially since he was able to guide her to the right path. Lola learned from Pedro's story how valuable the life we have here and now is, and how dangerous it is to balance on the edge. A month later, the young people got married. It was one of the capital's most colorful, memorable weddings with a huge cake and hundreds of guests. Needless to say, Inez and La Casito were there too. Later, Lola and Pedro asked the woman and her dog to move into their house. A few months later, they brought their newborn son, Antonio, into this house. Cloud Valdez was delighted with his grandson. He adores him and already planning to send him to the International School of Economics. Pedro opened his own security agency in the capital with the help of his father-in-law, where he only hires people after a personal interview. Most of all, the ex-convict boxer wants his employees to be good and reliable people who can be unconditionally trusted. As for Lola, she gave up all her bad habits forever, and now she is busy raising her son and creating her own unique landscaping around her and Pedro's house. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.